Hello, AP Lit. This is the last week, as far as I consider, of school. Uh, I plan on using this week as a review. No further assignments. AP testing starts the next couple weeks, so um, there's no need to kind of give you more stuff to do. Uh, our test is May 13th, which is still 10 days away from when I'm recording this, so uh, we still got quite a bit of time before we actually take our test. So what I would like to do is use this video as kind of a way um, to talk about the basics and review the whole year and what you need to worry about. Um, but what I expect you to do is ignore me, take your other tests, and then you know the night before, the day before, you're going to take the AP test, the lit test, uh, come and uh, watch the video and kind of review these things. Um, I'm also planning on giving you just a little quick um, sheet. I've, I'm posting it on Teams that you guys can have a kind of a cheat sheet. It's not that great. Um, but it'll at least give you some ideas and terms. And as you're writing, you guys should be able to um, you know, grab those terms. And I really think that that's gonna be powerful if you have some sort of um, you know, cheat sheet in front of you. Uh, a couple things before we kind of get too deep into this. There are several videos from the AP website or a, you know, AP's channel on YouTube that I encourage you to watch. One is the AP exams, exam walkthrough. I think you should watch that, it's about four minutes. It kind of tells you how the testing will take place for all your AP tests. Um, then there is a one minute how to prep, and then there's another one minute rules. All three of them are valuable, um, if only to talk to you about how the whole thing's gonna work. Like I said, I think they're gonna be generous on the grading, but at the same time, they're gonna have tons of ways to make sure you're not cheating, and if you're copying and pasting stuff from somewhere else, they're immediately gonna find that out. Um, so it's good to know kind of where they're at and what they're kind of you know telling you guys to pay attention to. So I encourage you to watch all three of those. I'll put throw put um, links and teams so you guys can find those videos and watch them. I encourage you to do it before you watch any of the actual other videos. Um, other than that, I'm here at any point, right? As I've always been. Um, if you have any questions, ask me questions. I'm I'll answer them. Um, but really, our and year's kind of over. And before I start a you know full-blown review of the year, I, I did want to talk a little bit about those assignments that I gave you this last week. I felt like those were kind of the best things to set you up uh, for what you're doing. The, the reading assignment by Zora Neale Hurston, Sweat, uh, it seems like you guys liked it. The colloquial language I felt was really, really important for you guys to wrap your mind around. I know it was difficult to read, but what you realize about the... Um, the characters, what you realize about the author, all those things play heavily. And that's kind of what I want you to focus on as you guys go into this AP test. You're gonna be you know, writing based off some prose passage. I imagine there's gonna be dialogue. And if you have anything intelligent to say about it, where you can actually say, look, the way they talk kind of reflects their personality, it reflects their passions and things we'll talk about. Um, I think that's beneficial. And Sweat was perfect for that. The second piece was that um, former AP test, the uh, Adventures of Peregrine Pickle. I told you when I first introduced it how crazy it was, um, and I hope you picked up on it. About half of you did, the other half kind of missed it. But that's, I wanted to show it to you mainly because I felt like it was a hard piece to do under a timed constraint. Um, if you're not paying close attention, you might not have picked up how absolutely absurd the situation is. And the absurdity of it is kind of the whole point about it, right? These, you're gonna have these two guys who essentially are going to try to murder each other and in the midst of it, they are going to have to balance this fine line of being really, really pissed off at each other, but at the same time, um, follow certain etiquette norms, right? Remember, at one point before they actually fight, they help each other take off their boots, right? That's ridiculous, right? If I'm gonna fight somebody, I'm not stopping and helping them get ready for the fight. I'm just gonna, I guess, murder the guy, right? Not that I... Uh, do it that often. Um, but that's that's how absurd it is. And yeah, that's what you're supposed to pick up on. When you guys get prepared to go into this AP test, remember, they're going to give you a passage. And there's not going to be a whole lot of context. And as you read it, you're going to have to kind of pull out all this deep meaning from it. It's completely appropriate to look at the situation and say, this is crazy. Like this is, this is absurd in a modern era to watch how this happens and comment on that. And so I think, and like I said, some of you guys got it and saw how ridiculous the situation was. Um, but anyway, uh, good passage. I felt it was a good one. And like I said, when it was introduced, it threw everybody for a loop. It's when the um, lit test score started to decline. Um, 
I know that my students, when they took it, were just absolutely baffled, but mainly that's because of the name Pickle and they couldn't get past that, which is you know ridiculous in its own right. All right, so with that being said, and with those two pieces kind of behind us, I wanna use them as the context in which we're gonna talk about everything throughout the year and review. How do I say this? Much of what I've done throughout the year was to prepare you for a much more difficult literature test. Um, a literature test that was intended to pull upon a large width, width of uh, reading knowledge, like you had to have a lot of books under your belt, like we said, for that open question. You had to understand poetry, um, and so we discussed in detail poetry. As I look back at the year and think about what I need to do to prepare you for this test, there's whole sections, whole weeks and months that I'm just like throwing out. Like you guys don't need to know how to analyze a sonnet, unfortunately. Um, all the ways that we were talking about getting you to interpret poetry, gone. I, it, it's just not applicable now. And so all we're really focusing on is what I would say is basic literary knowledge, right? Character development, setting, you know, the way a story progresses, those sorts of things. I don't know what the test is going to be exactly, but there's going to be some sort of character development. The setting is going to play some role in all this, and you're not going to have anything. I mean, those are things you can plan on talking about from the get-go if you're going to prepare yourself. But, I, you know, that's what we're focused on more than anything else. It's not that complicated, uh, but at the same time, we got to discuss these things. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk through a couple slides that I had given you throughout the year. Some of you guys already took notes on this, so you had this. But what this is going to be is a much more condensed sort of lecture that I would do. Um, and like I said, I will throw my slideshow up on Teams so you guys can have it if you want to print it out. And then you can look at it from there. But I, I just kind of want to walk through everything and, and discuss it with you. So if you remember, kind of at the beginning of the year, we talked about this basic fundamental idea of how stories are developed. Um, I think this is almost third grade review. You've talked about this throughout your entire literary lives. Um, but it's important to talk about just so we get a, you know, a foundation underneath us. The other thing I'm going to point out about story arc is I don't know how well in a single prose passage you're going to have that much development, although you will have some development, right? So when we talk about plot and we talk about exposition where we're going to kind of understand what's happening, my guess is a lot of that has already occurred. Um, if we're you know, the, if they follow the same format that they normally have, you know, they're grabbing these prose passage in the middle of a story. We've kind of already been introduced to some of these characters, but you'll still have some of that, right? There is going to be something happening. There's going to be some sort of conflict in the midst of the passage. So you are going to have some sort of rising action, whether or not it's resolved or not is another issue. I don't know if you're going to see the following action as a result of it. And I almost certainly you're not going to have any sort of conclusion from it because normally these are just kind of snapshots in a larger story. But recognize that, right? Recognize that you're gonna have this period of time in which you're getting to know the characters and the setting, and then all of a sudden something's gonna happen, and that's really kind of the crux of the, the, the piece, and you're gonna to have to analyze it in some way. A couple things I'll tell you about that. As you're being introduced to the characters, it's okay to make snap judgments. It's okay to classify them in certain ways. And I highly encourage you guys to write those things down. We've talked about this throughout the year. Find something about the character and, and identify them as it, right? Are they mean? Are they jerks? Are they really nice? Are they sympathetic? Are they weak, right? And just start to wrap your mind around that character and that, and that sort of context. Same thing with the setting. What, what's it like? Is it, you know, is it a, you know, a sword fight? Is we're having these, these two characters squaring off about to fight, but there's all these other you know, rules that society has on how you're supposed to go about this. You can murder a guy, you just have to do it in the right way. And if they ask you to take off your boots, you're gonna take off their boots, right? So analyze that, put it in some sort of paradigm and then continue to read the story, right? After you've analyzed it to a certain deal, um, certain level. And then as, as you see the conflict, analyze the conflict. Is there suspense? Does it fail at suspense? Does it, is it just kind of a sequential, uh, narrative where just a bunch of things are happening. Um, does it actually establish any tension or is it just kind of, you know, a descriptive story? Some of these AP um, essays are just, you know, a minor character who I, I remember one was uh, feeding her father and she just kind of was bouncing around the house, cooking and cleaning 
and doing all sorts of things. And there isn't a huge conflict, but rather her thoughts and her impressions of everything that's happening. And so you get a lot out of her. But at the same time, she does interact. You know, sometimes they do interact with the other characters and there is a conflict there, right? As they, you know, have a short remark to the parents and the parent, you know, doesn't like the food or something like that. And minor conflict occurs there. Talk about that. Those are all sort of all important things to kind of analyze. Identify the characters, what they're doing. Is there a protagonist, antagonist? You might not know that from the pros, but if you do have a clear idea who the protagonist is, you do have a clear idea who the antagonist is, identify it as such. Use those terms. They'll make you sound smart. Um, you want to be able to come across with as much literary knowledge as possible and show them that, yeah, that you actually paid attention all throughout the year. Um, of course, perspectives, always important to analyze perspectives. I feel like, how do I say this? I feel like perspective, point of view, often is a cop-out. It's easy to talk about whether or not a piece is in first person or third person. Um, and if you're desperate and you need like one more paragraph to kind of fill out the essay, go for it. But I feel with point of view, point of view adds an element to the story that you should immediately pick up on. And sometimes it's probably one of the least interesting things to talk about. That doesn't mean it's not highly important, right? We've talked about this. First person adds suspense in and of itself. When you only see in the minds of one individual and you're walking around the mind of one character, you don't see around corners. You don't know what everyone else is thinking. That adds suspense. Um, and I'd say talk about that, right? I'd say address it in some way, but that doesn't mean that should carry your whole essay. There's other things happening. The point of view just adds that other little element that you don't know. Likewise, third person, you know, omniscient, where you just kind of, you're in God mode and you read everybody's mind, and you see everything that's going on, adds a whole different element to the whole thing. You can now walk it, watch a car crash develop and know everything that everyone's thinking at the same time, who's texting, you know, who just got divorced and why they're all, you know, in their own minds and as this car crash slowly develops. All right, that adds another level. I don't know if it's worthwhile to talk the entire essay about it, but you should address that in some way that the perspective is gonna force this understanding on the reader um, and allows for details to be developed and revealed to the reader in an interesting way. So pay attention to that, um, use it if you need to. Also as well, atmosphere and tone. I think atmosphere and tone, if I was going to say, you know, I think a lot of people think atmosphere and tone are a throwaway. I don't. I feel like atmosphere and tone is sometimes the whole point of the story. Um, one of the things I love about stories is once I get into it and, it, you know, it's got a somber tone and it's got, a, you know, a really somber atmosphere, the way that affects me, right? My attitude changes. I'm somber. And as I re read through these things, I feel like that's very important. It kind of helps you understand the characters. It kind of helps you understand the setting when the author is projecting a certain feel to the story. That's worthwhile to talk about. And by the way, it's really hard to have those things clash. You can't have a uh, super depressing atmosphere and tone in the midst of having a character who's super bubbly and bouncing off the walls, you know, and just kind of being that um, very Gregorious character that's hard to do. If an author's pulling that off, it's worthy to discuss that. But typically these things go together. And so it's important to talk about, yeah, the atmosphere and tone, atmosphere and tone and how the characters, you know, fit in that whole thing. So discuss that. I find that, you know, incredibly valuable. At some point, I think early on in the essay, you probably want to hit that atmosphere and tone and discuss it because that, like I said, um, helps with the understanding of the characters and settings and everything else that you're going to talk about. Um, all this is important. All this is good stuff as far as looking at a story and the pros and figuring out what it's actually happening. But this, these are just tools. Remember, the thing we're shooting for is that deep, complex meaning. What is this story actually trying to tell us? What do we get from it that shows us a little bit more about, you know, the human nature, or shows us a little bit more about, you know, some deep feeling that you know is hard to describe in some way. That deep, complex. Uh, meaning is really what we're after. Everything I, you're seeing on your screen right now, the plot, the you know characters, point of view, all help develop that. Um, but really good literature is showing us something that we might not have realized in the past or showing it in a different way that we have not really analyzed it. And so these are all tools to do that. So focus on that more than anything else. I don't really wanna spend a lot of time on this. 
um, as we talk about story arcs. But remember, there's different ways in which story arcs occur. Once you identify who the protagonist, protagonist is in the story, it's worthwhile to talk about what their fortune does in the midst of the prompt or midst of the prose itself, right? Are they poor and then they rise up, you know, and get out of their poverty and, you know, at the end are in a better position? Um, you might not actually see that. You might not have enough information to talk about that. But I do feel as you analyze it to talk about, you know, the situation that character was when you first started the prose and where they're at at the end is important. You know, there you can pull some uh, good meaning out of that and talk when you talk about the com deep, complex meaning, you can actually talk about, you know, what the author's trying to convey about, you know, the circumstance of an individual where they started off poor and they wrote, you know, rose out of it. So the other thing that, you know, we should always focus on is the who, what, when, where, and why. Once again, these are things that you should be developing or analyzing quickly as you read through it. But as you sit there and you're like, what the heck? I don't know what to talk about. I don't know what to do here. Um, asking these five W's, of course, will help you to define the characters and figure out what's going on. Um, and so I encourage you to use those as well. I think it's valuable as we talk about character development to realize major and minor characters. Uh, even in the short prose we have, you have minor characters. You have people that are insignificant in any way. Um, they just simply help the story along. Whereas the major characters um, typically drive the proc. They're the protagonist, they're the antagonist. Um, what you know about them and how predictable they are is worthy of conversation, right? Um, do they do things as we anticipate them to do? Um, are they fully developed? What we really want is a three-dimensional character. Character's believable. Pierce is credible people that you might meet in real life, right? Um, you guys are all three-dimensional characters. You're all driven by different things, it, a thousand different things. It'd be impossible to list all the things that uh, influence you in your life. Um, that's why you're complex, right? You're not this storybook person, but it's important to analyze that, right? Um, Sometimes these two-dimensional characters will show up merely to push the story along in some way, right? Um, you might have a scene where two people are walking down the street and the mugger shows up and it's going to rob you um, and then run off. The mugger might never say a word. The mugger might never be described. They just have a black ski mask or something like that and they pull a brandish a knife and then they disappear. That's a minor character. But think about what that minor character just did to the whole story. Think about what you now know about the major character once they got a knife pulled on them. Um, now I'm like developing the story in my head. All right, guy and girl walking down the street, pulls a knife, guy starts crying when the knife pulls on him, the robber runs away. But what do we now know about the guy? He's weak, you know, maybe it's a female who is really like, uh, you know, strong and stalwart and she tells him to, you know, F off and, you know, kicks him in the shin or something like that and the guy runs off and it's the male who's like blubbering, right? We now know quite a bit about these characters because of they interacted with these minor characters. That's worthy of talking about. In fact, that's, that's what I'd start to base this prose off of is analyzing what we understand about it and how you know, it defies expectations and you know, all those sorts of things. But that comes across by understanding how these characters act in the overall piece. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind with three-dimensional characters is a third-dimensional character is not a perfect human being, right? They have flaws, they have failures. In fact, that's what makes them interesting. The reason why you guys are all interesting three-dimensional characters is because in some ways you suck right? In some ways, I suck. In some ways, there's a lot of things I do that annoy the crap out of you guys. That's what makes me interesting. Three-dimensional characters have interesting things, so don't think just because a person has some sort of flaw that that makes them less interesting or less three-dimensional or major. No, it just kind of shows that they're a well-rounded individual. All right, so as we get into character, as we move along in character development, you know, you guys are going to be introduced to these characters, and you're going to have to start to understand who they are and what drives them, first thing to do is to put yourself in their shoes, in their perspective, and understand what their circumstances is like. That last uh, essay I gave you about you know, getting in a sword fight, I have no idea what it would be like to be in a sword fight. If I put myself in the position of getting ready to sword fight somebody, and with the real possibility of either myself dying, or if I'm lucky, I get to murder somebody, um, okay, all of a sudden, I start to understand on a different level all the emotion that that character has, and I get to project that onto the character. Remember, if the author doesn't tell us 
how they're acting, we get to assume in a certain way how they're acting. We get to project. That's what natural reading does. Um, so would I be terrified to get in a sword fight? Yes, absolutely. I'd be terrified in a sword fight. If the guy asked me to help him take off his boots, no, I'd stab him in the neck right away. Then I'd be arrested for murder. Um, but understand that. Understand the circumstances. Why is the guy going to help him take off boots? Well, that's what the circumstances have. And you, and you want to, if you're going to murder someone, you've got to do it in a noble way. So it's a bragging right. So, th you know, throughout your life, if you're that guy who, um, you know, got in a sword fight, a duel and won, and everyone talks about it, as opposed to the guy who just stabbed someone when they're unarmed and stabbed them in the back or something like that. So understand all those perspectives, how those play into it. You know, also the whole development of, you know, your honor being insulted and feeling like, you know, because your honor was insulted, you've got to get back at them. But um, when you read that story, putting yourself in that perspective and realizing, look, you know, you've got to protect your honor. Your name means everything. And that's what's going to drive these people. It helps you to understand them a little bit better. It's not so much just paying attention to what, about what the author tells you about the character or what the character tells you about themselves. It's much more important to pay attention to those things um, that force them to act in a certain way. You guys all know people who brag about what they're like and they say, I'm the kindest person in the world or, you know, um, I never lie or something like that. They like always project this sort of idea of who they are. And then once they're put into an interesting situation, all of a sudden that, that changes. To a large degree, I don't really care what a person tells me about themselves. I care about how they act in a situation. If someone pulls a knife on them, are they cowering and crying or are they you know, reacting in some other way? That's important, right? I don't care what you told me before, whether or not you're the bravest guy in the individual. When a knife gets pulled on you, I want to see how you're actually going to act. Um, so pay attention to that. I think that's all revealed through the other stuff in the story, not just what um, the character themselves tell you about them. Oh, character perspective can change over the course of the story. I don't know if we're going to have enough time in a prose to see their perspectives change, but it'd be really interesting if you pick that up. If there's a character that starts off with a certain idea and by the end has a different idea of what the world's like, that's valuable. I would have latched onto that in a heartbeat and show the complexity of an individual to admit sometimes that they're wrong and to change their minds, um, which is really hard to do. I've done that many, many times. Last thing I want to talk about are the literary devices. Um, these are the things that you're going to use to push along your deep, complex thesis that you're actually arguing. These are not the ends unto themselves. And the thing I hate the most about teaching literature and doing these essays is it seems to me like it's, yeah, like a word search. Like just find the literary device and fit as many of those words into the essay as possible and you'll do all right. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding what literature brings to the, to the, to the reader. What does it reveal about, like I said, human nature? The literary devices are the tools that the author uses to do that. It's important to recognize them. It's important to identify them. But that is not the whole reason why you're writing an essay is to just say, oh, I saw alliteration, right? That's not why anyone's writing anything. It's just to put in some alliteration, um, except for uh, pen. Remember when you read that? All right. So I'm going to give you all these. These are our literary devices. We started them. We got, I don't know, into them a little bit. And then all of a sudden, uh, coronavirus and everything else kind of jacked up our system. So we didn't finish these out. These are not new terms to you. You guys worked on them as far as identifying them and showing how they actually work in the text. If you follow um, the literary device assignment that I gave you on these words, you'll be in good shape. It's not enough to simply say, right, that there's, uh, you know, antithesis. It's important to actually set that antithesis up, especially antithesis, right? A lot of these things require some deep explanation as, to, as far as what's happening, right? Um, so it's important to identify it, but that's not the end all be all of the whole essay. Remember, you have your deep complex meaning that you're discussing and antithesis is one way in which the author develops that. Um, so have these words, have your definitions that you already wrote out next to you so that you guys can use these terms. I highly encourage you to use as, use them if you can, and, you know, as much as possible, uh, but throw those in there. But remember, that's not the whole point of the, of the essay. The other thing I'm going to tell you at, while we're focused on literary devices is you've got to use the text. Um, in your last essays I graded, some of you guys were not citing enough. Uh, you need to cite. 
You need to focus on the words themselves. They're incredibly important. If you are not using the text, you're doing this whole thing wrong. And I don't know how to state it more bluntly than that. There is something, remember when I went on my rant last week about capitalization, how it just shows that you're lazy if you're not capitalizing everything. Um, if you're not citing the text, it reveals to me that you're not reading it closely enough. You should be focusing on the text, reading the prose. If something jumps out at you, if there's a term that's odd, I would freaking circle it or do something, star it, um, and figure out what they're trying to do, why they're setting it up. If they describe the atmosphere, the tone in some way, and they use particular adjectives, that's all important things to pull out. There's no way you can talk about any of these literary devices without actually quoting the text that shows you about these literary devices. Um, but some of you would try it. Some of you would actually write an essay where you're like, oh, you know, there's an illusion and he's gonna use this illusion to talk about all this other stuff and you'd always be talking in your own words and at no point would you actually show me. There, you know, the author uses an illusion here, quotation mark, let me show you exactly what the illusion is and then discuss it. And as you discuss it, going back to that quote and say, look, look at what he what he refers to here. Look at what that the single word is doing and what meaning comes from that single word. You've got to be discussing the text. Um, I'm not saying long three lines of quoted text. I don't want that. But you've got to be using the words, you know, phrases um, to push your, push your uh, essay along, but using the evidence. Every paragraph should have a citation of some sort, some sort of reference to kind of give it that foundation. Another thing I want to talk about really quickly is play and screenwriting. I don't know if they're going to give you a play. They, they might give you a play. And remember, when we talked about plays, um, the important thing to realize is plays are generally told through dialogue, obviously. Um, there's not a whole lot of stage direction. You don't get long descriptive passages that describe the front porch and what the front porch looks like. You just get um, dialogue, text, right? And you gotta kind of extrapolate what's happening from that, which adds a whole other development. One, it influences the way people speak. Uh, you know, we now gotta explain certain things. I introduced to you Hamlet, but we didn't get to read Hamlet. Um, but Shakespeare does that a lot where he's like, you know, now the cock crows and, you know, that's his way of saying it's morning time because dialogue's important. Dialogue reveals a lot about the person, a lot about the characters themselves. And so I do encourage you to look into it, not what they say about themselves, but what, how they actually talk and what they actually say, you know, are they angry people? You get that from dialogue. Um, are they super nice and pushovers? You get that from dialogue on the right hand side of your screen. Remember I showed you this when we we're talking about dialogue, uh, about the way in which good dialogue operates. That top one was really bad. It's just Mary and Sylvia and they're talking about their outfit. Nobody cares. The second one's a little bit better. Hello, Mary, Sylvia, I didn't see you. My, that's a wonderful outfit you're wearing. And she responds, I need a drink. All right, so we know a little bit more about it. Sylvia's kind of nice. Mary's just like, you know, kind of brushes her off and moves on to the next topic, which is drink. Um, the third one is far more interesting, mainly because it actually shows us a... Um, you know, develop some sort of conflict. Hello, Mary, Sylvia, I didn't see you. My, that's a wonderful outfit you're wearing. Where is he, Sylvia, right? We don't know who he is. We don't know what happened, but Sylvia is kind of the same person. She seems like, you know, nice, um, you know, complimenting outfit, uh, but Mary's like, you know, in a whole other mindset and is gonna do something else. We can actually analyze to a certain degree those two characters based off those four lines. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to write an entire essay, but you can actually start to describe what you think Mary is like, what you think Sylvia is like, and you get that simply from the dialogue. And so I encourage you, um, if, you do, if you do get a play, but even if you don't get a play, if it's just a normal um, prose and there's any dialogue into it, is to look at the way in which they interact um, in discussing what you know about the characters themselves. And that's it. That's all the review I've got. It's not too hard. Um, once again, you're paying attention to character development, character interaction, what the author tells you about what's going on and you're gonna look for that deep, complex meaning. Um, and with that, we kind of bring it to the end of the year. Uh, you know, I, I think I told you at the beginning of the year, I really enjoy teaching AP literature. Uh, literature for me um, helps me understand the world so much better uh, than I would know otherwise. I have a very limited perspective on how the world operates as a white middle-aged um, male living in Arizona, I am very limited. I don't know that much. Um, but literature allows me 
to understand different people. It allows me to understand feelings. Um, and that's really what the whole point of this class is about. If, if I could, you know, I like talking about this stuff. If I could just get rid of, you know, all the testing and grades and we could just sit around and talk about, you know, stories and experiences, I'd be all over it. Um, but unfortunately, that's not an academic setting. And so we've got to make sure that you're held accountable for all this stuff. Um, but I do enjoy teaching you. I wish we had a full year so we can actually, you know, do everything that I planned on doing. There's a whole bunch of stuff we left on the table that we didn't get to do that makes me sad. Um, if you're following me still at this point, if you're still watching this video, which I think this is kind of a long video, um, I guess I'm going to uh, acknowledge that I am not returning to teaching next year. Some of you guys picked up on that because I was not teaching War College. Um, I'm going back to law, or I've always been practicing law, but um, teaching uh, was a fun diversion for me. And um, I really did, like I said, I really did enjoy it. And I enjoy interacting with you guys. My favorite thing to do in teaching is standing in front of the classroom and reading stuff with you and getting your feedback and having your commentary. Um, and teaching online just does not have that same feel. This is this is completely different um, and it's not as nearly as satisfying as actually interacting with you. But I do enjoy interacting with you. I, that, that really is the joy of teaching. Um, but it's been fun. I hope you guys have a good summer and a good life. Um, if you ever see me around town, uh, come say hi. And uh, good luck with everything else that's going on.